on World News Tonight. Hefty bargains. Haitian kidnappers put a price on the heads of the captivated Americans. Green plans. Bill Gates extends a hand to the United Kingdom in efforts to support climate recovery. Mix and match. America expands its jab rollout with new vaccination combinations. Splendid signaling. Prague celebrates spectacular displays of light now with the latest entertainment tech. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with the updates on the hostage situation in Haiti. According to Haitian officials, the gang responsible for the kidnapping of a group of missionaries, including 16 Americans and one Canadian, is asking for $17 million to release them. An abduction and now details of a mammoth ransom first reported by the Wall Street Journal, citing the Haitian justice minister. $17 million, $1 million per person for the 17 missionaries kidnapped by the notorious 400 Mowozo gang in Haiti. Among those being held captive, a mother and her five children, all but one under 18, according to a friend who did not want to show her face on camera, but goes to the same West Michigan church. They're very genuine. They are loving people. They had a heart for missions. She says the father was also on the trip, but not with them at the time of the abduction. Former FBI Special Agent Tim Gallagher says the agency discourages any payment. The Justice Minister telling the New York Times, often these gangs know these demands cannot be met and they will consider a counteroffer from the families. We know these groups target U.S. citizens uh, who they assume have the uh, resources and finances to pay ransoms, even if that is not the case. On the ground in Port-au-Prince, conditions are dire. Dr. Margaret Degand, who works at a hospital there, says the violence is inescapable. Every level of the society, even the kids of people that sell things along the streets, okay, they are being kidnapped. So the situation has never been as bad as it is. Ten years ago, Indiana native Rex Beyer was targeted by kidnappers on a missionary trip and was shot in the leg when he tried to escape. Bill Gates is working with the British government to invest and bring down the cost of new greener technologies to help countries hit net zero emissions targets by 2050. The UK government has struck a deal with Bill Gates. It says the billionaire Microsoft founder will invest to help bring down the cost of green technologies. Gates says he's looking at what projects to back and won't delay taking action. We'll be funding these projects jointly next year. Uh, uh, the UK's already got a number of applications coming in. We have lots of small companies that are inventing better technology uh, for doing these things. So over the next five-year period, we expect at least one of these technologies will be ready to scale, and over the next decade that all of them will be. The news came at a global investment summit in London on Tuesday. It's a precursor to the COP26 talks on climate change due to begin at the end of this month. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has a list of technologies he wants Gates to back. That includes better batteries, green hydrogen and systems for capturing carbon emissions. Johnson says private sector backing will be key to making progress worldwide. The developing world has got to be given the, the help it needs to decarbonise. Why should you? We in the UK, uh, we've been pumping this stuff into the air for, for 200 years. Those countries haven't, uh, and uh, they're going to need help to, to, to reduce their CO2 output. But the only way that that, that, that help can be given in the, in the volume required is with, with massive private sector investment. The breakthrough energy catalyst run by Gates brings together private investors who want to tackle climate change. Now the new UK partnership will see a total of about $552 million going to green projects. Johnson's government has pledged half that sum, with Gates making up the rest. The European Union top officials said that the recent ruling from Poland's constitutional court challenging the supremacy of EU laws is a threat to the bloc's foundations. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said she is deeply concerned by the ruling, which she said is a direct challenge to the unity of the EU and undermines the protection of judicial independence. 
In a defiant speech before the European Parliament Tuesday, Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki lashed out at the leadership of the EU for threatening his country with financial and political sanctions. It is not acceptable to impose one's decisions on others without a legal basis or to use financial blackmail or to talk about sanctions. I reject these threats and coercion. I reject politicians blackmailing and threatening Poland. His speech followed comments from European Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen, who said that the bloc would act to rein in Warsaw over its move to reject parts of EU law, possibly by withholding post-pandemic recovery funds. The rule of law is the glue that binds our union together. Honorable members, we cannot and we will not allow our common values to be put at risk. The Commission will act, and the options are all known. The bloc is at odds with Poland over a recent ruling from the country's constitutional court that said some EU laws were inconsistent with the Polish constitution. The clash has magnified long-running concerns of the EU about what it perceives as Poland's rolling back of democratic norms, including the country's crackdown on LGBT plus rights. It remains to be seen how long the EU will tolerate Poland's stance, as Warsaw insists its constitution stands above any other law, and at the same time rejecting the idea that it would one day leave the EU. An early morning commuter train in Australia derailed after hitting an abandoned vehicle, trapping the driver and wounding several others. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Timothy Phillip, reporting from Melbourne in Australia. For more, Timothy. Yes, Sheila. Authorities said the full car train hit the car in Wollongong, just 56 miles south of Sydney at 4.15 a.m. local time, knocking the first carriage over and tilting the second. Firefighters rescued the train driver, who was taken to hospital along with the guard and two of the train's nine passengers. New South Wales Police Superintendent Craig Island told reporters the investigation is still ongoing. Police set up a crime scene after a person was reported running away from the site of the incident. It was not known how long the van had been parked on the tracks. The derailment further adds to commuter problems in Sydney. Train drivers had already planned a strike against prioritization plans, which was expected to shut down 70% of trains. Back to you, Shana. All right, thank you. That was Sadhudar in a World News Special Correspondent, Timothy Philip, reporting from Melbourne in Australia. North Korea making waves launching what it claims was a sub, uh, submarine launch ballistic missile into the East Sea. It's the North's eighth provocation of the year so far and comes just a matter of weeks after the regime tested fire four short range missiles. North Korea fired a submarine launched ballistic missile off its east coast on Tuesday, setting off alarm bells across the region. The launch was reported by military officials in South Korea and Japan and comes just after South Korean envoys met with U.S. officials to discuss the nuclear standoff on Monday. Pyongyang has ramped up its military activity dramatically in recent weeks, and Tuesday's launch marks its latest missile test. The missile was launched shortly after 10 a.m. local time from the sea in the vicinity of Simpo, South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said, where North Korea keeps submarines as well as equipment for test-firing missiles. It wasn't clear if it was fired from a submarine or from a test barge. News of the launch quickly overshadowed a major arms fair taking place in Seoul and pulled Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida away from several scheduled events. Kishida called the missile test regrettable, while South Korea's National Security Council called an emergency meeting and urged Pyongyang to return to the negotiating table. In a statement, the U.S. military called Tuesday's launch destabilizing, but said it did not pose an immediate threat. Analysts suggest Pyongyang's latest tests aim to match or surpass South Korea's own quietly expanding arsenal. Pyongyang has decried what it calls double standards by Seoul and Washington as it faces international sanctions over its weapons program. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News.
Welcome back and now we move on to the updates of the COVID pandemic. The FDA could authorize fully vaccinated Americans to receive a booster shots that's different from the brand they initially received as early as this week. As early as tomorrow, the FDA could authorize fully vaccinated Americans to receive a booster shot that's different from the brand they initially received. The approach of mixing and matching COVID vaccines would affect tens of millions of Americans. First reported by the New York Times and confirmed by NBC News, the government will not recommend one shot over the other, saying the public should stick to the vaccine originally received. But for 15 million jabbed with John Johnson & Johnson, new research shows antibody levels rose 76-fold with a Moderna booster compared to a minimal increase with another shot of J&J. Expected to sign off on Moderna and J&J &J boosters this week, the FDA's decision will then be reviewed and likely approved by the CDC. Amid a pushback on vaccine mandates, authorities are doubling down on their importance, especially for those at higher risk. General Colin Powell, who was fully vaccinated, still lost his life to COVID because he was immunocompromised. Tonight, with so many lives on the line, tens of millions are waiting for an extra shot of protection. Life has returned to normal for millions in Britain since coronavirus restrictions were lifted over the summer. But while the rules have vanished, the virus hasn't. Early on in the pandemic, the UK had among the highest number of COVID infections and deaths in Europe. But an effective vaccination campaign helped the country bounce back. Now the landscape has changed again. The UK is reporting close to 50,000 new cases of COVID per day, making it one of the worst daily infection rates in the world. There is also a resurgence of the virus in other parts of Europe. The Netherlands is reporting about 3,300 new daily infections, up 48% since the start of the month. Germany is seeing 6,500 cases per day, an increase of 26 percent over the same period. In Romania, one person has died every five minutes in October. Ninety percent of those fatalities were unvaccinated patients. An EU member, Latvia, has just imposed a month-long lockdown because of skyrocketing cases there, with new infections up by 49 percent in the last week alone. The reason for the increases across the continent are various, from low vaccination rates to a decrease in protective measures such as wearing masks. If there is a ray of hope, it's that deaths and hospitalizations across Europe have risen at a much slower rate thanks to the effectiveness of coronavirus vaccines. Moscow's mayor ordered the city's first coronavirus restriction since the summer as Russia registered 1,015 daily COVID deaths, a new record for the infection-riddled country. Medics at this hospital in Moscow are frustrated. They're still seeing high numbers of seriously ill COVID-19 patients, most of them unvaccinated. As well as cases, the number of people dying from the virus is rising. On Tuesday, the country reported 1,015 deaths, a record. It's prompted Moscow's mayor to announce Tuesday new citywide restrictions set to last until the end of February. As of next week, all unvaccinated over 60s must work from home, employers must move 30% of staff to remote work, and vaccine mandates for service workers will be extended. It came as national authorities called for the introduction of a non-working week from October 30. President Vladimir Putin is set to decide on Wednesday which of the proposed measures will be implemented. Putin has encouraged broad vaccination but says it should remain voluntary. Anti-vaccine sentiment is high in Russia, with only 35 per cent of the population inoculated. German Health Minister Jens Safan has reportedly said the COVID-19 state of emergency from March 2020 could soon expire. Let's cross over to other than a world in special correspondent Inuka Ponza reporting from Cleve in Germany for more. Inuka. Yes, Shanali. Germany's state of emergency allows the government to act in a crisis by expanding executive powers and restricting the powers of the parliament. Earlier this year, the federal government took steps to unilaterally impose restrictions on regions with high rates of infection 
without having to seek approval from the states. These restrictions include curfews and limited the number of people in public spaces. The COVID-19 state of emergency was approved by the parliament on March 2020. German Health Minister Jens Spahn has said that the special rules relating to the coronavirus pandemic could end on November the 25th. Germany's health minister cited the country's public health authority, the Robert Koch Institute, and its assessment that vaccinated people posed a moderate risk, in addition to the current vaccination rates, as reasons for the state of emergency to expire on November 25th. But many indoor rules requiring proof of negative tests vaccination and other hygiene measures would need to remain in place. Furthermore, Germany may miss its target to donate 100 million COVID-19 vaccine doses this year due to conditions imposed by manufacturers and delivery shortfalls, a health minister official said in a letter to Brussels. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. And that was other than a world news pressure correspondent Inuko Impozzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. South Korea will launch its homegrown space rocket 11 years after it started and what to look forward to until 2030 when South Korea hopes to make a lunar landing. record size hail hammered parts of Queensland as a storm swept across the Australian state. A spokesperson from the Australian Bureau of Meteorology said hail storms measuring 16 centimetres were found breaking the existing Australian record of 14 centimetres. The Olympic flame for the Beijing 2022 Winter Games has launched in the Chinese capital after being flown from Athens and Greece. Tensions on the streets of Guatemala City after protesting army veterans breached Congress grounds with riot police using tear gas to repel the group. Singapore's first flight under an expanded vaccination travel lane program landed from Amsterdam with around 80 passengers on board. Major automakers around the world stepped up investments behind the electrification of vehicles following up on their digital event EV Day back in July. The Stellantis is now making good on its pledge towards partnerships and joint ventures in the industry. Automakers around the world have pledged to earmark large investments to boost battery development towards electrifying their latest production lineups. Toyota Motor is the latest to join, earmarking 3.4 billion U.S. dollars for battery development and production in the United States through the end of the decade. This includes a plan for a new 1.3 billion U.S. dollars electric vehicle plant, which is anticipated to enter production in 2025 and expand through 2031, by which time it aims to employ around 1,750 people. On Monday, local time, automaker Stellantis and LG Energy Solution announced that the two companies have entered a joint venture to produce batteries for electric vehicles. The battery cells and modules will be produced at the LG Energy Solution plant, which will supply Stellantis assembly plants in the United States, Canada and Mexico for installation in its electric vehicles. This includes plug-in hybrids and full battery electric vehicles. Under this new partnership between Stellantis and LG Energy, the companies plan to build a new battery manufacturing plant with a yearly production capacity of 40 gigawatt hours. The location of the facility is still under review, but plans to break ground are set for the second quarter of 2022, with production to launch by 2024. There's a need for more battery plants as environmental regulations continue to become increasingly tougher while car buyers show increasing demand for electric vehicles. And finally tonight, Prague residents gathered to observe light and laser shows displayed on the landmark monuments for the Signal Festival, which resumed after a two-year hiatus because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The festival says it aims to bring spectators modern art and new technology, with the city serving as the canvas. Colourful and intense was how viewers summed up a sound and light show projected into the St. Cyril and Methodius Church. Festival director Martin Posta said his edition of the festival was the first time augmented reality displays were available to spectators via smartphone app. Spectators said that they were impressed with what they saw as people scanned the installations with smartphones. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.